just a small addition to my experiences with a certain substance. Let's call it eating cookies. And so when I speak of this in the future, I may often refer to it as I had another cookie today. And so yesterday I'm playing my guitar and I'm sitting here and I'm looking out at the broad expanse of the sky. And it was a beautiful sunny day and there was some amazing cloud configurations and I looked up into the sky and I'm like you don't even need DMT cookies when you have opened your eyes when you've become awake when you have a certain level of enlightenment about the world because the light's gone on in your consciousness and you see it how many people just never ever look up into the, the sky? I'm looking up into the sky every single day for a great portion of it. Particularly when I'm walking on the beach, I'm just like this. Naturally, if there's, there's clouds in the sky, because they very often are amazing configurations. And I've said on lots of occasions that there's no chemtrails around here, very, very rarely. You've got beautiful natural clouds. And that is a real joy, I'm telling you. When I see photos of all these chems, you know, streaking across the sky in America, I just look up and you can't help thinking, as much as you detach yourself from it, that that is fucked up. I don't want to see that in the sky. Because what it says to me is there's something very, very sinister going on. And of course, if you lend yourself to thinking about it more deeply and learning about it, there is something very, very sinister going on. And then when you learn more and more about the people that are doing these sinister things, then it becomes a very droll environment in which we're living in, if you immerse yourself into that side and facet of things. So I don't do that. And one of the things that I've done, obviously, in my life, I've detached myself, I've extricated myself from regions where this pro prolification goes on. And so I'm in a beautiful region. And so therefore my mind, my thoughts are beautiful. You see, it all pertains to environment for the vast majority. And so, I took my cookie play my guitar, looking out, and I'm thinking, oh, I don't need another cookie. And I'm thinking, fuck it, why not? Enjoy yourself. And so I did. I took another cookie. And I went out onto the balcony. And uh, I'm, I'm looking up. And how it goes, it, it's kind of like... <laughs> you go like that, because what you see is so awesome. It's so astonishing. You know you're in the presence of something vast, vastly intelligent. And you just kind of like your, your knees, they break and the body goes down uh, and you're looking up and you're kind of like this. And I was, I was pressing myself up against the wall as, as I'm looking out as if there's some sort of a pressure coming down on me. And I'm aghast. And, and, and I'm like, <sighs> and then it says to me, well, dance then. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. And I'm jumping up on the spot and I'm going from side to side. And I'm going to show you how I was going. I'm going like this. business. These Maori rugby players. You see? And so it clicked in my mind and I go, well that's a very probable point of where this comes from. This said to me, well dance then. Why dance? Because Look at the splendour that you're in. Aren't you happy? Yes, 
I'm ecstatic. And so I started to do all these Maori dances. And there's one other curious thing about it. One of the first cookies that I took when I was on the beach here with Guy, I saw a mechanical entity. And the mechanical entity, it seemed to be about um, seven or eight feet tall. And it was made out of gilded, like, bronzy gold. And the actual entity was constructed out of angle iron, uh, gilded angle iron. And the head was triangle. And it was doing all this sort of thing. And the arms and the legs, they were made out of like um, Flemish angle iron. Let's say um, with, with the old bedsteads that you used to get, with the long struts that support the mattress. It's um, a right angle and invariably just, um, you know, black steel. But this entity was a cross between a bronze and a copper and it was flemished like it had been hit by a small round beveled hammer and it's all dented in so it's got this flemish effect and it was shining and i saw that and it was doing that and then on subsequent cookie experiences i'm walking around and i'm going all the time and sometimes because what the cookies give you it's it, it, it often has sexual connotations. It's very orgasmic. It's, it's very heightened in this libido region. And they play with you. It plays with you. And it does this. And it gets you doing it. Because it's kind of like... It's so saucy, it's like so amazing and it's so sexually stimulating that it makes you do that. And on other occasions, it's the complete tongue down. Also, what sprung to mind, when you see these Mayan carvings, invariably, they're like that, aren't they? I don't think it's too much of a stretch of the imagination people to assume that all of these ancient um, cultures were dabbling in some variety of psychedelic and just to see the Mayans all the time with the tongue hanging out what other explanation have you ever heard I've never ever heard of any explanation for that nobody remarks on it I'm remarking on it and when you've got pictures of them with the hands up like this, in this sort of thing, that it's always going on, very mechanical. And this entity I saw on the beach was a mechanical entity. And then when you got the marriage, all this business. And so, that was um, quite insightful. And so I went down to the beach after and I was feeling different this time. It made me pensive. It wasn't so much like everything's so beautiful. It was, but also I was pensive. Like there was, there was deeper meaning. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, so I've done that a lot now. Should I continue to do that? What I'm doing, I'm taking a 50 milligram cookie and the 50 milligrams, open eyes, gives me very, very similar all the time. If you take a smaller one, then you get less. If you take a bigger one, then that's when you get into the realm of kind of like the unconscious because you lose the everyday awareness you go into fully another dimension whereby you don't have any egoic consciousness but you have an awareness of something that you've known forever
and that you're it. And even though it's so bizarre, you know you're it. And there's kind of like a comfort there in that. <sighs> and so I just thought I'd bring you that little update. Just putting pieces together. And now I look at the Maori rugby players. I look, I look, look, they're from New Zealand. And then you look at the, the Incas from South America or the Mayans. And then they've got the same thing going down. And then these entities appear when you take these cookies. Seems to me that there's, there's something which is very pervasive around the whole world within the human psyche. And that's why there's certain cultures that have maintained an expression of that. And I wonder if the Maoris, the rugby team, I wonder if they know what they are emulating. I wonder if they really know. Or whether it's just one of these things that's been culturally accepted and they do it without having any cognition of it. I.e., like the vast majority of people in the Western world, with, say, like Easter, Shrove Tuesday, and Halloween, and all these sorts of things, do they really know where these things derive from? Even Christmas. You know, people can say, oh, it's baby Jesus. Nothing to do with that. That, that's just an add-on which came hundreds, if not thousands of years, in some instances, from other cultures. And so, it's a curious thing. There's so much depth to everything. And most people, they are living superficially. They're just like water boatmen on the surface of a lake. They've got no comprehension of the lake below them. And yet the lake below them, you see, is a completely different world, which they would never experience, because they only ever walk on the top. And so they have some sort of level of awareness of the world above that thin line. They've got no awareness about what is below. And this is what the vast majority of the, the human being is on this planet. No awareness whatsoever. But if you start to peep down below, then that's when another world opens up. That's when a whole myriad of worlds and dimensions open up. And your consciousness can have a great level of acceptance for all of these varieties of universes, parallel universes, dimensions, with all the crazy beings and activities that go on within them. Initially, it's completely bizarre and bewildering, and the ego will be afraid of it, because the ego doesn't like anything out of the ordinary. And so it wants to keep on a level planing. It wants to keep in the familiar environment that it's used to. I mean, look at people. They're even scared just to do the most mediocre thing on this planet. Like do some scuba diving or, or do some dangerous sports or climb some mountains or, um, you know, start looking at the paranormal or anything. Oh, no, no. The ego says no. So closes the, the, the human mind down. But once you have experience of the supernatural and you take mastery over the ego and you say to yourself, look, the only reason you're afraid is because it's new to you. Of course it's bizarre. It's something outside of the paradigm that you've lived in all of your life. And so you are going to feel apprehensive about it. But what we're going to do is, we, we are going to be like pioneers and we're going to keep taking a step forward on our journey of 
self-discovery. And it gets easier. Sometimes you may encounter something which, again, really compromises the ego. And you think to yourself, oh, should I really be doing this? When you're climbing a mountain and progressively it's getting colder and colder and it's getting harder and harder to breathe as the atmosphere gets thinner, then the mind is like, starts thinking about, the ego starts thinking about it, its demise and it starts saying, you, you're not going to make it, are you strong enough, you're not strong enough, you look how weak you're getting, turn back now, that, that's what the ego does. But the higher level of consciousness says, well, no. I'm going to self-actualize because I'm going to climb this mountain because what it's going to do for my spirituality is going to be so immense and so gratifying and so satisfying to stand on the top of that mountain feeling so accomplished and being there where very, very few people have ever been and then I'm going to come back down, tell the story but also just know that I've done it, I've had that experience and so that's what this life really should be about. It should be about climbing the metaphorical mountains. As many as we can, really. But make sure you're prepared. You wouldn't attempt to climb a mountain in your board shorts, would you? You'd make sure you got all the gear and you make sure you're fit enough and experienced enough. And so what we do then is um, we go down our path of life and if we have a level of awareness about us, then we're, we're gathering up information and we'll be transmitting that information to wisdom and we'll be guided then by our ever increasing wisdom and we will know intuitively when it is time for us to take another step up the mountain. Hmm? And so if you apply this to your lives, of the stage you're at and the fears that your ego has about anything and everything. Question those. Once you have the understanding that the ego is your protection mechanism and all it wants is a very, very peaceful, tranquil life, then you can start to get your head around that it doesn't want to be compromised. But you see, when we compromise ourselves, that's when we grow, isn't it? How many compromising situations have we had in our lives which weren't necessarily comfortable at the time? Do we look back on now in reflection and say, well, that was a marvellous lesson, an experience that I had, because now I'm so much wiser for it. So, just a few thoughts for the day, people.